All right, so we're going to build on what we did in the last, uh, the last lecture. We're going to talk a little bit more about the memory model of the GPU, a little bit more about the architecture. We're going to dig into, uh, into what's inside the GPU just a little more. Um, we'll learn about some cool things and cool architectural features that are on the GPU that can help us uh, make things go a little bit faster. Um, we can learn about some potential uh, errors uh, that we'll make as well. So we'll talk a little bit about task parallelism and how threads cooperate uh, in the GPU. We'll talk about shared, constant, and global memory. So we'll make some distinctions about on-chip and off-chip memory and what that means. And then we'll do a little programming demo at the end uh, with some shared memory. Um, yeah, it's just a demo again, so it's, uh, well, whatever. Oh, yeah, the marketing stuff again. Um, we taught people. Okay, great. Um, so same things as before, just to kind of give you a little bit of a highlight. Again, we do products, uh, services, and we do training. Uh, again, if you like what you see here, um, the, the training courses are, are really, really good. Um, it's obviously much more intimate than this. You know, we'll sit down in a room, there might be 10 of us. You get to do all these exercises yourself. It's about half lecture, half hands-on. We do a lot, more, it, a lot more depth as well, so you get to learn a lot more details about it. So it's a really good, it's a really good course, um, and, and again, we, we provide that. Either we can do private ones on site, or you can come to one of our public ones that we, we hold throughout the US and, and sometimes in Europe as well. Um, and again, yeah, so we do that. We also do services, so if you have concerns or, or you, know, you want even just to bounce ideas off us or whatever, we can do consulting. We can actually do co code uh, uh, coding as well, of course, too. We've got uh, a lot of really talented uh, software engineers. Okay, yay, that's marketing. Uh, we also do products, so we actually have off-the-shelf reverse time migration uh, solutions if you're doing seismic, electromagnetic finite difference, uh, time domain algorithms, and again, yeah, the, the teaching CUDA OpenCL and, and AMP as well as just other HPC stuff is also. Okay, so enough of the marketing. Let's, uh, let's get back into the, the good technical stuff and the reason we're here. All right, so data parallelism. You saw this slide in the last lecture. Uh, the idea is, again, we have an array. Uh, we're going to perform the same set of operations uh, on, the, on the structure. The operations can't be data dependent, or we prefer them not to be. Again, dependency, the one on the left, is, uh, is independent. That's great for us. And uh, the one on the right is, uh, shows dependency, which is not as good for us. Parallel computing, uh, we have some, some arrays, and again, we want to add up arrays A, B, and C. We, you, we did this in the demo, except we actually had one thread add up uh, one, uh, one element versus in this partition. I've chosen it that task zero would be responsible. By the way, if I were to do this in the CUDA kernel, I, I would actually use a for loop. I would go from, one, for, from zero to three and actually add up the three elements, it, have one thread do, do more than one addition. That's fine, you're allowed to do that. But probably you would want to have one thread do each addition. Okay, so now we're on to the new stuff. So task or thread le level parallelism, we make a distinction here between data parallel and task parallel. And task parallel being multiple tasks can run concurrently, they're independent, but they can execute different operations. So instead of all doing an addition, we might be doing completely different things. So in a building a house example, data parallel would be if you had three painters that all went up together and all went down together on the wall. That's data parallel, whereas task parallel might be somebody's doing the wiring while somebody's doing the plumbing while somebody's doing the painting. So it's a different kind of parallel. This is task parallel. So in this task zero is responsible for doing an addition here, and task one is responsible for doing a multiply and an addition. They're independent, but it's a different kind of parallelism. Um, is that Tron? Um, task, yeah, I just love these pictures. All right, all right, task parallelism and data parallelism, they're both parallel, but it's a different kind of uh, spectrum. And in reality, your problems aren't going to be as simple as adding up at a vector array, obviously. You're going to have a mix of both task and, and data parallelism, likely. Uh, in terms of a definition, granularity, if, if you have something that's fine-grained, you're doing um, a low computation to communication uh, ratio, that's not good necessarily. Uh, sorry, my laser died there for a second. The low computation to communication, um, you don't want to be talking a lot for every computation you do. You'd rather do a lot of computation and not a lot of talking. And that's what, uh, that's what coarse grained uh, falls under. So we generally prefer coarse grained, and that's going to scale better for us than, than fine grained parallelism. 
So right now, up until this point, we've said CUDA has really been a data parallel model, but this isn't quite true. And in fact, even in the last demo, we kind of violated that a little bit. So we need to look at the hardware and understand when data parallelism works and when it doesn't. Okay, so now we dig into the GPU. You'll remember this slide from the last lecture, but the one change we've made this lecture is we've broken apart the GPU itself and we're actually going to dig inside the GPU. So what's actually in that chip in the GPU? And it's something called a streaming multiprocessor. And the streaming multiprocessor is a collection of compute resources. What is it? It's a bunch of processors or cores. They do math. They do the actual work. It has registers. That's on-chip memory that's right next to the cores. Extremely fast. Registers are your friend. You also have specialized memory resources, things like caches and shared memory, which is what this lecture talks about. So all of these fancy little devices are right inside the streaming multiprocessor right there. They're right inside that. Okay? So we're going to actually take a look inside the streaming multiprocessor now. Okay, so you remember this from the last lecture. We have a group of threads that are in a block, and then the blocks can be allocated as a grid. This is the picture I want you to remember for this lecture, um, as well as one more later. These two pictures are the most important ones. You can forget everything else I'm, I, I say otherwise. But this I really, really want you to have in your mind. So your GPU has a predefined number of streaming multiprocessors on it. How do you know how many you have? You can query it. You can look it up in Wikipedia. You can look it up wherever. It'll tell you how many streaming multiprocessors you, you have on your part. I think my GPU has one. But it's a laptop. You'll forget it, right? But more, the higher-end Teslas, for example, will have up to 16, for example, on, on the Fermi. It will have 16 streaming multiprocessors. So what happens is you're going to launch your kernel. It's divided into a bunch of blocks. These blocks are then allocated to a streaming multiprocessor over which you have no control. It's magic to us as the programmer. You have no control over how these blocks are allocated. But presumably, this is a, a reasonable pattern, block zero could be chosen by the scheduler, by NVIDIA scheduler, to run on streaming multiprocessor zero. What ends up happening, though, is because your blocks are independent, that works out very well because you're not relying on block one to be finished before block three is executed, for example, because there's no guarantee that block three doesn't run before block one. And if you tried to wait, you could get into a deadlock scenario. So for example, if block, um, block four, right where my, my laser pointer is here under streaming multiprocessor zero says that, um, or sorry, block zero says that block four must be finished before it proceeds, that would cause a deadlock because block four is not scheduled to run until block zero is done. So then you would have created deadlock on the GPU. So the data independence at a block level is what, what gives the GPU its, its scalability. And you'll also notice that also means your code will run on any device with any arbitrary number of streaming multiprocessors because at the block level, you don't care how the blocks actually get distributed to the GPU. You might, and if you do, that's, that's probably an, an issue with your algorithm potentially. So a block will also only execute on one streaming multiprocessor. So block zero will not be partitioned across multiple streaming multiprocessors. You are guaranteed that once it's been allocated a streaming multiprocessor, it will stay there. You don't know which one, but it will stay on that multiprocessor until it's complete. Uh, let's see if there's anything else I want to say there. And also, yeah, of course, you're going to have lots of blocks, so a multiprocessor is going to be responsible for handling a lot of blocks. What this means is that any possible distribution or order of those blocks is possible. You, they might run concurrently, they might run sequentially, you don't know, you can't control it. So what this means, and this, this sentence is a little bit confusing, so I'll take a second to explain, it says blocks can explicitly coordinate but cannot synchronize. And that's sort of what I mean by you can't force a block to wait until another block is finished. If you were to do that, you could create deadlock. However, they can synchronize, and by synchronize I mean, let's say you have a queue of work that you're, you're pulling work from. So you're doing image processing. So you've got a bunch of images. You can have the first block grab that first image and process it, advance the pointer in the queue, and then the next block can take from that queue. So you can, you can, you can coordinate between a, a queue of work, but you can't say block zero has to finish before block four starts because you don't know the order. 
So this independence is what gives us scalability. Um, so problems, you're going to have an algorithm. You're going to be doing something. Maybe you're gene sequencing, image processing, oil and gas modeling. You guys have all the cool problems. You have to divide that into blocks somehow. You have to mentally think about how you're going to divide that into blocks. And they must execute in a coarse grain fashion. You can do some atomic operations between blocks, but for the most part, you can't necessarily communicate from block to block. There's really no reliable way to communicate from block to block. So at the block level, the coarse uh, data model still applies. However, inside a block, you can do task parallel things. How do you do that? We did it actually in the last exercise. You can put if statements. You can put for statements. The threads can do whatever they want inside the block themselves. You just can't communicate from block to block. So if you really, really wanted, you could put a switch statement at the start of your kernel and switch on the thread index and at, at every thread in a block do something completely different. It would kill your performance, but you could do it and that would work and it would be functionally correct. Um, oh yeah, and I say that. It has performance implications. We'll talk about that this afternoon. So this is a task parallel kernel. You've got a kernel. Thread index zero is doing something different than the rest of the threads in the block, okay? So, but from block to block, again, they're completely independent. But the thread X of every block is doing, is thread zero of every block is doing something different than all of the threads in the block. This is the other important picture that I really want you to remember here. Now, I would draw this slightly differently just to, just to highlight some of, the, some of the details about this. But this picture is crucial. This blue uh, background here on the device, this is the physical GPU. This is the chip. This is the actual like square chip on the GPU. It contains all these multiprocessors, one to n, depending on how many you have in your GPU. This device memory is not on chip. It is actually in a nice little horseshoe shape. If you were to look at the little rectangles, if you were to rip off a heat sink, we've never ripped off a heat sink ever. Okay, we did. Um, yes, and you can actually see the device memory. We were trying to liquid cool it and that didn't work out so well. Anyway, um, the, the device memory that surrounds the chip is actually off chip. This diagram makes it look like it's kind of close. It's not. Um, this might as well be in Hawaii if this is in San Jose. It takes a long time to move information from device memory to on chip. Once you're on chip, all this stuff on chip is very, very fast. It's very, very local. So that's sort of the picture I want you to, to think about here. This is actually on, excuse me, on the GPU, and this is the memory, the global memory, when you CUDA malloc it off chip. All right, so you can see registers are on chip. You've got some shared memory, some caches uh, on chip here. So um, you as the programmer are responsible for mapping the right portion of your algorithm to use the right memory type, okay? And we'll talk about how we do that. Okay, lots of text here. I'll just kind of show some highlights of it. Registers. Registers are the fastest form of uh, memory on your chip. The neat thing is they're automatically assigned by the compiler. In the last exercise we did, when we said in index equals block dim, blah, 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 that index was stored in a register on chip. So you don't have to do anything special to do that. If you said int temp, float temp, that's a register. It's, it's allocated right on chip for you. The compiler takes care of that, okay? Shared memory. So shared memory is your second best friend after registers. It's very, very quick. You can almost think of it as, yeah, it's a small little block of memory. It's effectively a user managed cache. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about shared memory as well as the syntax throughout the rest of this lecture and how shared memory works. Um, it can be accessed by any thread in the block, and we'll talk about how that, uh, that works as well. Local memory, okay, so I have a little bit of a gripe with the name local memory. Local memory is really anything but local. It's actually off chip. This local memory is actually stored in global memory. Never been a big fan of the name. In, in OpenCL, local memory is actually the replacement for shared memory. So if you come from OpenCL land, local memory and shared like local memory is shared memory in OpenCL. Um, but local memory in CUDA is actually off-chip memory. When do you use local memory? You don't want to. It's really bad typically. Typically, um, when would when would it happen? If you have too many registers that you don't have enough registers on your chip, instead of having a failure, what'll happen is it'll spill. Imagine paging, you run out of memory on your system. It's the equivalent just at a much lower level. So it's stored in global memory. Why is that bad? Because you want it to be in a register, but it's not stored in a register, so it's off chip. That's why I don't like 
the name local so much. But why it is called local, and the good reason it is, is because it's exclusive to a thread. It's, it's, it's private in, in the sense to a thread, which is why it's called private memory in, in OpenCL. Global memory, it's your largest memory on the device. Um, and actually what this, this orange block is showing is it's actually showing device memory. This is none of this stuff is on chip. This is your big blob of memory. When you CUDA malloc, all your stuff goes in here. Um, you need to use global memory. And keep in mind, global memory is still much, much faster than anything the CPU has today. So it's still really good, but you just want to keep stuff on chip when you can. Um, but it is about 150 times slower than, say, a register or shared memory. Constant memory, it's, uh, it starts off in global or in the, in the device memory, but then once it's been read, it gets cached on chip in one of these caches here. So that there's a small little block of memory where the constants start, but after a while they get cached during the run and then, and then constants end up becoming quite, quite a bit quicker. We'll talk about constants later. So. so the last three, local, global, and constant, are what are shown in this orange block. The first two registers in shared memory are actually on chip. And again, they're your friends because they're fast. So shared memory is very, very high performance. It's probably two orders of magnitude faster than global memory. Um, but you only have a, real, a fairly small amount. You actually only have 16 to 48 kilobytes per streaming multiprocessor. And you might say to me, well, that's completely useless because I'm working on like a six gigabyte problem. 48 kilobytes, come on, you're insulting me. Well, the thing about it is, again, keep in mind that 48 kilobytes is local to a very small number of threads that are working on it. So your threads might only be working on a couple hundred kilobytes at a time, in which case that 48 kilobytes is actually quite useful for your, for your say, 500 threads to, to use. Yeah, it's not necessarily useful throughout the whole space, but that's what global memory is for. Once that block is done, it's going to release that memory back for the next block to use locally. So it actually ends up being, of course we want more, but at the same time it actually ends up being quite a useful, uh, useful tool. Shared memory has block scope. And what I mean by that is any thread can see each other's values in shared memory inside a block. Why would you do this? It avoids redundant computation um, or even redundant memory accesses. So let's say, for example, I was building a filter, you know, and it needed to know five or six neighbors on either side of it. You could have each thread read its own value from global memory into shared memory. Once it's in shared memory, you can work out of shared memory. There's no need to go reread multiple elements over from, from global memory. It's all been stored on chip. So it's really useful to, to reduce the memory bandwidth that you need um, if you can reuse data. If you can't reuse data, it's not so useful. I, I agree. That being said, you, could also do, you can also use it as sort of a scratch space for, to help you with registers as well, but we'll talk about that maybe later this afternoon. It effectively is a CPU cache is really what it is, except you as the programmer get to manage what goes in and out of that cache. So we get to control what we put into it. So it's even better than cache, because we get to control it. All right, so constant memory. It's a special region of device memory. It's again fairly small. It's only 64 kilobytes in size, but um, they're cached for streaming multiprocessor. So you declare your constants at file scope. So you'll say underscore, underscore, constant, underscore, underscore, int, something. And um, the constant will actually be stored when you read it in your kernel. So when your kernel actually reads it, it brings it into the streaming multiprocessor and caches it. Uh, it's kind of a little bit of a, of a strange name when it says uh, CUDA memcopy to symbol because you actually set the constant from the host. And you're like, that's not really constant. It's constant from the kernel's perspective, but not from the host. And why is that good? Because you might change, say, let's say you have filter cap parameters that you're like an FIR or something like that, and you have different caps on, the, on that filter. You might want to change that from kernel to kernel. So you can call CUDA memcopy to symbol. However, you can also just call plain old static constants like pi, and that is fine, because pi doesn't usually change. All right, so our fine-grained approach is possible within CUDA. There's no reliable mechanism from block to block, but threads within a block can communicate via shared memory, but that implies synchronization issues, right? Because if all of a sudden multiple threads are reading and writing from shared memory, how do you know when data has been written? Because those threads might not finish at the same time anymore. So you need some sort of synchronization mechanism to 
to prevent um, race conditions. Race conditions, great. Um, some examples, yeah, the power blackout apparently was one. I didn't make this slide, but I'll assume the author was correct. And the pathfinder, there was some sort of priority uh, inversion. So you can get race conditions or deadlocks when, when, uh, when, you, um, when, you run, when you're not properly synchronizing or, or semaphoring your, your, your thread. So how do we do it? We eliminate our concurrency hazards through synchronization. We use, uh, we use uh, you can use mutual exclusion, barriers, locks, and semaphores to do this. Now, how CUDA specifically does this is, is, um, is using a command called sync thread. But before I do that, at a coarse grain level, you minimize your chance of a, a concurrency hazard because blocks in theory should be independent. Now that being said, you could make a program that I'm sure you could create deadlocks. But I think you kind of got to go out of your way to do that. So that's why we say minimizes versus completely pre prevents. But you could do a while block x is not finished spin, right? And that, that could potentially create a deadlock. But like I say, you're kind of going out of your way to do that. But inside a thread, now we want to use shared memory, for example. And all the threads can read or write from shared memory in a block. We might need to use something to, 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 prevent, uh, to prevent race conditions. And that's where we use the underscore underscore sync threads. This will appear in your kernels only. And what it does is it makes sure all threads in the block have reached that point of the code. And the code will halt in that block until all the threads of the block have reached that point. Of course, other blocks can do whatever they want because they're on different streaming multiprocessors and they're independent. But inside that block, you will, you will stop every thread until every thread reaches that. This is used to avoid uh, read after write hazards, particularly in shared memory. Um, it's allowed in conditional code, but you have to be a little careful. You don't want to do if thread index equals equals zero sync threads. That's not so good because thread zero will hit there and it will stall and wait. But then the other threads are going to skip that sync thread. So that's not so good, right? Because you're uh, potentially creating deadlock. So you don't want to do uh, a sync threads inside an if statement unless all the threads of the block are going to travel through that uh, through that sync thread. Otherwise, you can you can hang your code. So you have to do you have to exercise a little bit of caution there. All right, this slide just gives a little bit of a summary um, of of the memory model uh, itself. So we've got um, we've got some global memory again. It's uh, it's off chip, uh, constant memory uh, and shared memory uh, on chip. Um, what this what this slide is actually showing you is what each kernel can read. So each thread knows its thread ID and block ID. It can read constants and textures, um, and it's read only. That's why it's under the read. Each thread can read and write registers, obviously, uh, local memory, shared memory, and global memory. And the CPU can read and write constants, textures, and global memory. What you'll notice, though, is the CPU, for example, can't write directly into shared memory. That's, again, up to you as the programmer in your kernel to manage the shared memory and, and have it read and write there. So let's talk a little bit about the syntax of shared memory and how we actually declare shared memory because maybe we want to we want to share some results between threads. So you use the underscore underscore shared qualifier and then underscore underscore, and that's going to declare um, some variables and arrays inside uh, inside shared memory. So in this case, we're declaring uh, 256 floats inside our, our shared memory. Uh, again, we start off with our normal index calculation as per usual. The shared memory is going to read from global memory. And again, this operation is very typical uh, in, in kernels when you're using shared memory. You're going to read from a global location i, and you're going to store it in a local location thread index. Why don't I use the global index there? Because this thread index is local again to the block. And remember, shared memory is seen across the block. So this code running on a different streaming multiprocessor is going to have its own shared memory allocation. So you don't want a global index here. In fact, it, as mentioned before, you won't have enough space to do a global allocation. You're going to have a very small local allocation. So this is local to the block. All threads in the block can see this. Now we need to sync threads. We need to stop to make sure that all that data from global memory has been written. Because the next step, you want to make sure that it's fully written before you start to use it. It looks like it's sort of reversing it or something like that and then storing it back into global memory. Um, so now it's reading out of shared memory into global memory. You'll notice that you use it just like a normal array. 
no problems there. But again, keep in mind that shared memory is used to solve a very local problem on a much bigger picture. So you're, you're kind of tunnel vision in on a small section of that problem. You read and write to it just like any other array. Use your square bracket or pointer notation to do that. Uh, you might want to do dynamic memory allocation. You can absolutely do that. No problems to, to allocate dynamically. If you want to do that, you're going to need to use the keyword extern in front of the underscore underscore shared, and you don't put a size in the square brackets. Okay? The difference is how do you tell the, the program that you're allocating it? You put as a third argument here the number of bytes of shared memory that you want. So before, remember we just had grids and then blocks, so the number of, uh, uh, basically the number of blocks and the number of threads. You would add a third argument, which is implicitly zero unless you specify it, which will define the number of bytes of, of shared memory. Now, you only get to do this once, so if you need to have like, like for example, let's say you wanted to have like S data, S data one, S data two, I'm picking terrible names of course, but you could just declare a bunch of shared allocations in a row and that's fine. But when you're doing it dynamically, because there's only one parameter that you can pass here, you only get to do it once. So if you want to do it more than once, you kind of manually have to offset the indices, which is sort of what this code is showing you. It's showing you that pointer A is going to be allocated at the, it's pointing to the start of the shared memory, and then pointer B is offset into that, that shared memory. So, and you can mix and match. Like you can actually have some, some, some predefined or static allocations, and then you can, but you can still only have one, um, one dynamic allocation. Okay, so now we'll, uh, we'll get into the programming demo again. I think I fixed the read-write permissions. But just kind of as a couple highlights to this uh, presentation, because I, I really do want you to take away a couple things. This picture right here, I can't emphasize this enough. When you understand this picture, you have a really good idea of what the GPU is doing. You have global memory, and then you have some on-chip resources that you have available to you. And then the second picture that I really, really like is this one here, because it shows you how the GPU is actually distributing the blocks across the GPU um, in some predefined order, and it gives you some hints as to what you can and can't do um, from a block level as well. So that's, um, those are the big highlights, I think, for, for, uh, for this uh, presentation as well. So, Okay, so this exercise, what we're going to do is we're going to do a, a, a simple vector dot product. So we're going to take two vectors. Um, we're going to read the information from global memory, um, multiply together and store it in shared memory, and then add up, add up the results. So we'll get a chance to use shared memory here uh, so that we can save uh, some reading and writing to and from uh, global memory. Okay, all right, I'm going to run back to the computer. All right. Okay. Oh, and any, anybody want to volunteer? Do we have another volunteer? Where's the enthusiasm? <laughs> all right, I can code if you guys don't want to volunteer, that's fine too. Okay. All right, so we'll bring up our exercise here. Okay, and somebody asked me to make this a little bigger, so hopefully this is, um, hopefully that's a little bit easier to read in the back there um, as well. So, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a vector dot product using some shared memory here. Um, if we take a quick look through the code, again, we've got some, some random data that we've generated as well. We're going to check our error. I think they've even got the prototype here for us. These are all device pointers um, stored in C. Um, again, we've got a reference here, uh, so some host stuff uh, as our reference and inputs. These are allocated uh, on the device. And then uh, we've got uh, grid and block uh, information uh, scheduled uh, or uh, defined there. Uh, host stuff is allocated. We've done our device allocations here. We're copying to the GPU. And now we're going to launch. Now you'll notice we're only going to do this on one block. If you wanted to do a real dot product, it would obviously be more than 1,024. You would do something a little bit more fancy on, on the reduction side of things to reduce this. But for now, just to illustrate the concept of shared memory, we're going to keep it to one block. So yes, I realize it's a little bit limited in, in that regard. But, um, but in, in that sense, um, it'll, it'll show you how shared memory works. Then we're actually going to copy a single float back to the host from the device, and then we'll print out the values, and we'll see if we get the right value. Okay, 
So all that stuff's written for us, and, uh, and we're just going to write uh, the kernel. Awesome. One more time for volunteer. No? No? Nobody wants to write? Do you want to write again, Ramesh? Or that'd be awesome, Ramesh. Thanks. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I was hoping. Perfect. Okay, yeah, so while Ramesh is, uh, is doing that, there, there isn't going to be uh, a lot of code in this section. It might be, um, I don't know, say 10 lines or so, but it'll show you how shared memory works and some things that, uh, that we need to do. Thanks again. Sure. All right, appreciate that. All right, so we'll start by allocating uh, some shared memory. So it'll start by underscore, underscore shared. Perfect. And we'll do so. It'll be a float, so that's great. And uh, we'll call it, say, maybe smem or something like that. We'll do it statically, so you can put a bracket. And we'll use this n value here, uh, this capital N, and that'll declare 1,024 floats uh, on the, uh, in the shared memory for the GPU. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to read, uh, we need to do an index calculation. So we'll do the int uh, index as, as always. All right, so block dim, sorry, yeah, block dim x, capital D, perfect. Perfect with an x, yep, times uh, uh, block index dot x. Oh, sorry, idx, I'm sorry. Yeah, perfect dot x plus thread index dot x. Perfect. Okay, so again, just to recap what this guy, this, this line of code is actually doing. Again, it's calculating your global thread index um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the structure. Okay. So now what we're going to do is yeah, we're going to load uh, the, the, the shared memory. And we'll actually load it into uh, thread index, actually, because we want to load it in locally. And, and again, so we'll change that to thread index.x. We'll load that in locally. And that's going to be equal to, and we'll actually take in a, uh, we'll do a index times b index, because we'll actually do the multiplication while we're reading in global memory. So yeah, a index yeah, times b index. Perfect. Okay, so what this is doing is this is reading in from device memory, it's multiplying, and it's going to store it locally into, uh, into some shared memory for us. All right, so that's great. Um, any thoughts about what magic comes next? Sync threads, that's right, underscore, underscore, sync threads. Why do we need that? Because we're writing to shared memory. So before we can use the value here, we need to make sure that all threads in the, in the block are, are synced up before we do that. Now. It's going to be, uh, we're going to do this a little bit crudely, but uh, we'll basically just have thread zero now add up all the elements in inside shared memory. So we can do an if statement. So if we're thread index dot x equals equals zero. So we'll arbitrarily pick the first thread to do this. We'll do a for loop now. So we can do a for, uh, for int uh, i equals zero, i less than uh, n. Perfect, i plus plus. Then we'll uh, we'll basically oh we should probably dec let's declare a temp variable just above that we'll call it uh, sorry just between the if I guess is is fine yeah so we'll do a float uh, temp set it equal to zero perfect sum equals zero yeah and uh, we'll do sum plus equals and then we'll just add up the s mem i okay so we're at we're having thread zero add up all of the uh, all of the values into sum and finally after the for loop we'll need to store it in c. So we can just dereference C, so star C. Probably want to do it inside thread zero, because we only want thread zero to do or to do this. Yeah. So just outside the perfect. Nice work. So star C, and that'll be equal to sum. So we'll store that uh, we'll store that value in sum. Okay, so what that's going to do is uh, again just kind of recap. Loads the values in from global memory into shared memory. Why is this useful? Because this way, we, can, we don't have to keep reading and writing from global memory. So this is much more efficient than, say, doing A times B and storing it back into global memory. That's not so efficient. It's better to keep it on chip than add it up on chip and then write it back out to global memory. So we're able to share results. So this is a, this is a more effective uh, a way to, to, use, uh, to use the GPU. All right, should we try compiling? Let's see if this works. Perfect. Did it uh, work? Sure, let's try it. Okay. All right. So it gives us uh, some outputs here, and it tells us that the CPU value we generated was the same as the GPU value. So we were 
correct. Yay for us. All right, so for fun, let's, uh, let's actually try to um, delete the sync threads and see what happens. So we can yeah, close that up or whatever, or comment out the sync threads. And um, yeah, you guys will love this. Same value. So we don't need sync threads, right? Well, <coughs> yeah, it turns out that it's undefined behavior, and we got lucky. And um, it just so happened that in this case, we didn't need sync threads. That being said, um, again, it, once, once you kind of get larger problems and things like that, you actually can run into issues if you don't have sync threads. But um, I also wanted to show you that potentially you could get, you could get the correct result. It also makes debugging particularly tricky when you don't have that particular, um, particular feature. So yeah, so that's, uh, that's the, the demo for, uh, for shared memory and um, kind of a, an overview of the, the memory model. And uh, oh, are they? Oh, sorry. They're ra yeah, I randomized the numbers from run to run. I'm sorry. So, but it's showing that the CPU and GPU in both cases are matching up to be the same number. So, yes. Sorry, but I, I, I randomly seed the, the random number generator each time I run. Perfect. Good. Oh, good. Uh, lots of questions. Great. So we'll just start this way. Good question. So uh, the question was, and I'll say this for, for, for the folks watching online, uh, the question is the new GPUs have um, caches on them. And, and the idea is that, okay, well, maybe I don't necessarily need to use shared memory anymore. It's a really good question. Um, the nice thing about shared memory is you have complete control over what goes in it, though. Whereas that GPU cache, you don't know necessarily what's in or what's out of it. So because of that, it gives you a little bit more fine-tuned control. Caching definitely closes the gap, and it actually, yeah, why use shared memory if the cache is going to solve your problem? And it's probably worth trying just to see what happens before you spend the time to actually play with shared memory. Um, that being said, it doesn't take a lot to start running into issues where you start basically thrashing the cache or blowing uh, the data out. Like on a large problem, if you start striding through memory and you start bringing in lots and lots of data, the cache may not, no longer have that, that, those, that information you need locally, so you actually can still save some, some local information. So in all of our products, without exception, we still use shared memory vigorously. Um, because yeah, it's absolutely critical to, to, to do that. So yes, caching has closed the gap, but yeah, it's a good question. Um, you can still definitely run out of, uh, run out of cache or, or run too much data and it, it basically uh, invalidates the cache for when you need that value later. So, good. Can the compiled current code then go into the data link to start that new the, the code itself, it's a little bit of a mystery um, as to where it actually, it actually resides on chip, um, presumably cached. It's, it's all managed by the driver. You don't actually control um, anything regarding the instructions themselves and where they reside. So what's the global memory? Does it also duplicate? I'm, I'm sorry, the global memory. Most of the global memory is, is usable for data. Yes, most of the global memory is usable for data. You'll have almost full access to the, to the memory space before you run out of, uh, run out of memory allocation issues. Yes. Yeah, there is. So I'll try to recap that uh, question a little bit. And, and the question was, okay, so I did an if index is less than n, and, uh, and some of those threads are ex exiting or returning from the code immediately, but some continue um, on. And then I need to call sync threads to, to do my block work. Why doesn't that necessarily create deadlock? Um, technically, it's an undefined condition, because you are, you, are, you are branching um, across the sync threads. 
In practice, what we see, though, and what we've seen, because we, we just have to experiment a little bit, we don't, again, the answer isn't necessarily given, is that it seems as if some of the threads within a warp hit that, it's enough to trip it. But it's still, it's still a little bit undefined as to the, the correct order of behavior. But we've seen similar effects to you where we, we've not been able to deadlock it in certain configurations. But we have been able to deadlock it in others. So as far as we know, what you're doing is safe, but it's not, in theory, it's not supposed to be done that way. Yeah, and that way, in that, yes, you need to design it so in theory that all threads in the block hit <coughs> that uh, sync thread. But it's done, at, it's not, even though it's done at a block level, we find that the actual mechanism is done at a warp level, which we'll talk about warps this afternoon. So, good. Right, so the comment was that uh, if your thread exits, it's automatically going to be in an equivalent state to sync threads. And, and it could be, um, again, somewhat undocumented in that, in that regard. So, but yeah, that's, it's, it's behavior that we've observed as well. So that's consistent. Good. Yes, so yeah, actually, thanks Ramesh, if you could kind of scroll down. So the question was, um, sum is in a register, and C is in global memory, and we're, we're actually seeing a performance, or we might see a performance hit. So the, the, the alternative, now C is only allocated as a float, it's, but let's say we allocated C as, as a global memory array si with the same size as A and B. If we were to do that, instead right here, you would put C index equals A times B. And what would happen is it would be multiplied and then it would be stored back into global memory. Then presumably you would have to go through and, and you would read from global memory instead of shared memory right here from memory location C. And you'd be reading and writing uh, twice effectively to global memory when you really didn't need to be, when you could have kept it on chip. Yes, you would see a performance degradation. For this problem, you wouldn't because the runtime is so small, you wouldn't notice it. But once you scaled up the data, you'd really start to notice a lag, um, and it might be a, a three or four X lag or something like that, versus keeping it in shared memory. So, good. Uh, as in, sorry, the question was, is there an automatic way to do the reduction? And you mean like a library function, for example? Um, NVIDIA has a, some sample code that does the reduction for you. So you could in incorporate that as a device call, for example. Um, you, could, you could include that as, 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 as one option. Um, but otherwise, uh, no, you're, up, you're on your own for t to do the reduction piece itself. Okay, that's, yeah, that's a really good question. So the question was, if you access the same portion of shared memory, will it serialize your threads? It turns out that shared memory actually has a broadcast mechanism that will allow the same value to be delivered to multiple threads in one clock cycle. Um, so in that regard, it, shared memory is, is pretty good. Shared memory, we don't talk about this at all today. It's, it's more advanced, but shared memory is, is allocated in banks. It's allocated in in uh, groups of 16 or 32 deep. When you start accessing elements in the same, different elements in the same bank, then you start to run into serialization issues because you're only allowed to pull one element out of shared memory um, per clock cycle. So if, you, if you're accessing the same bank by multiple threads, that gets serialized and then there's a slowdown. And that's called a bank conflict. And that is reading or writing that is correct, yes.
Yeah, so the question is, he's saying why, you know, we don't necessarily need to have the sum um, in a register, and that's absolutely correct. You can totally have multiple threads access the shared memory and do the reduction in shared memory, and that's exactly right. And NVIDIA's reduction <laughs> example, that's exactly how it's built. So that's a really good insight. When you do the reduction, you probably wouldn't want to just have one thread do the, do the additions. You'd want to have multiple threads do the additions, and that's, that's exactly right. That's a good observation. Yes. Yes. Yes, so the, exactly, perfect. So the question was, okay, so task parallelism is unavoidable. What happens if I use all the threads in the block to do one task and all the threads in another, in another block to do a, another task? That, that is perfect. That is perfect optimization. You want all your threads in the block to be doing the same thing. You can even get a little more coarse than that. As long as all your threads in, in, in a warp are doing the same thing, you won't see a performance hit. It's when you start to break apart the warp and, and, we'll, and this is all like, again, the fourth lecture. We'll, we'll see this in more detail. But yeah, definitely at a block level, if all the blocks are doing a different task, that's, that's not a problem at all. So, and you'll get, because all the threads are in that block are computing the same and doing the same arithmetic. So yes, that's a good way to do it. Um, here's, a, here's a good one. Um, I had somebody once who was doing a problem I can't remember if it was, it was something that converged. And basically, once it converged, the thread is dead, right? And the problem with that kind of thing on the GPU is that all of a sudden, you kind of get fragmented, right? Because certain threads finish before other threads, right? But you could potentially, it depends on what you're doing, but you could potentially order the problem so that if you knew certain metrics, like certain threads are going to end earlier, and you move that data to the beginning, and, and then the threads that are going to run later towards the end, then the threads are going to run longer and blocks are going to collectively finish sooner. And that's better than keeping underpopulated blocks with, say, only two of the threads doing computation. So, no, it's, it's, it's a real problem, and especially depending on what kind of, especially if you're doing a convergence type criteria problem, yeah, you have to think about clever ways that, can you, can you somehow group your data in, in, in a certain fashion? So it, it could be just simply sorting the data by some parameter before you pass it to the GPU. And I've definitely seen performance improvements by doing that um, so that the threads roughly finish at the same time as opposed to leaving a block with one or two threads executing, which is not efficient. Yeah, we talk a lot about branching. I have some lovely diagrams again in the fourth lecture, but just to kind of give you a little bit of a sneak peek there, there's a bit of a cost for the comparison, say a clock cycle to do the comparison. But your main cost is the fact that in this case, so thread zero is, is, is doing something, but the remainder of the threads are sitting idle. And that's where the problem it lies, because now the GPU is actually not being even remotely used to its full capacity. Um, so, so that's really the penalty of the if statement. Once the if has ended, the threads reconverge and then they continue marching down the program together after the if. Sorry, and, do you, and Ramesh, thank you. You don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> so the if basically blocks all the threads, essentially. Is that right? What's that? Sorry, the ifs. The if statement in this case is that the same thread, and all the other threads are not doing anything. But say you have other things that you're going to do further down. Yes. So all the threads are going to get blocked on the, until the if statement. That's correct. So what Ramesh was asking was he was saying, okay, so threads 1 through 511 are not doing this. They basically are stalled waiting um, until that. Now, actually, the mechanism behind what's happening is it gets masked off. The GPU actually will compute all of these things for threads 1 through 511, but the result is masked off, so it's never actually used. That's actually the mechanism behind it. Thanks again, Ramesh. I appreciate that. I'll start there and then I'll grab yours after, sorry.
Yes. So the question is, are there any tools that would help you say, is this code, is there a better way to write this code would be, it would be an example. We'll talk about the visual profiler in, in lecture four, and it has some pretty neat automatic tools. Not sure that it would hint to use shared memory in this case, um, but, it would tell, but it would tell you also the caching of it, so it would tell you how well you're caching it. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure that it would hint to necessarily use shared memory. I think that's really up to you there. It will tell you how well you're accessing your global memory and if your threads are idle. So it might comment here that, that, that warps are being underutilized or there's branching and divergence of causing some grief with this code. But nothing that would maybe say, your code, it should really use shared memory, use it. You know, nothing quite that blunt. But, um, but yeah, there'll be some hints uh, that'll point you in that direction for sure. Yes. Yes, the question was, would it be more efficient to have multiple threads, like say 10 threads do this? Absolutely. And again, it was just for simplicity to illustrate that. But in fact, I'd even submit, why, why stop at 10? Why not use all the threads in the block to do an addition? And then every stage, you, re you reduce it down by a, by a power of two. And that's actually what the reduction, th that's what the good reduction algorithm that's in the, this NVIDIA SDK does. And it actually does it for more than one block. Obviously, in my, this won't work if my, if my um, my two vectors were greater than um, 1024, for example. So it's, it's a very limited example, just trying to show you the idea of that shared memory can share information between threads. That's the, that was the objective here. Yes? Uh, so the question is, if there was an if else, do the else threads run in parallel with the if? The answer is no. Again, sort of what, what Ramesh was alluding to, all the threads in the block run the same thing. They just get masked off the results. So the block will have to do both the if and both the else. All the threads will have to do that, but only the conditions that are true will actually generate a result. Yeah, so no, it's a SIMD in that sense, single instruction, multiple data. It's a true SIMD processor in that sense. It can't do different tasks. The, it has to do the same operation on every thread. Good. Sorry, there's, there's one, was there one more question? Yes, thanks. Sorry, an atomic ad? Yeah. Yes, you can do an atomic ad um, if you want. An atomic ad, just for, for everybody's benefit, I don't talk about atomics today, um, guarantees that a thread is written and completely updated its result before the, the next thread can access it. Um, yeah, you, you could do you can do atomic ads on both global and shared memory, um, but uh, in this case we, we wouldn't need to necessarily do that. Um, even in the even in the full blown reduction, I don't think I would use I don't think I would use an atomic ad even in, in that case. It's expensive because it's obviously causing some serialization, so we try to avoid atomics when possible. Yeah. Sorry, in the back, you had a question? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, how do you choose an, the number of threads in the block and the number of, uh, um, sorry, the number of grids in the block? I have 10 slides on that this afternoon. And so I think I definitely want to defer that question. That is a phenomenal question, and it is really one of the big questions for optimization. There's a lot of factors that come into play, including register usage and, uh, and shared memory amounts. So yeah, it's, I, I think I am definitely want to defer that one because, yeah, we talk about that one a lot. So it's a good topic. I'm excited. Sorry, yeah. Oh, sorry, I thought I saw a question. Yes? File-based. Yeah, okay, so the question was, sorry, why is the constant done at file scope, basically? Um, that's a really good question. The constants are a little bit of black magic as well. They're loaded by the driver when the program is loaded. So it needs to know at basically launch time what the constants, uh, what the constants are. Um, and presumably the file scope just either makes that easier for the compiler or versus putting them embedded in the kernel. 
I'm not sure. It's a little bit of black magic. It's just sort of one of the rules of constants that it needs to know it right at the point that it's going to run it in advance. So, so it's loaded at the beginning. So, yeah. Good. This is great. Lots of good questions. You guys are smart. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, up front. Uh, you mentioned Please, yes, branch divergence. Uh, Yes, so the question is, this is an issue at the warp level, not the block level. You are 100% correct. I have not introduced a warp yet, and that's the reason we, we talk about it at the block level. But yes, at a warp le it's exactly done at a warp level, and in fact, if, you, if your condition is true for the entire warp, there's no divergence. That's correct. Yes, so didn't want to confuse anyone. In the back. Correct. Yes. So the question is, uh, yeah. So I'll try to I'll try to paraphrase. If, if you don't like my if you don't like what I'm saying, ask it again. Um, how do I know to some extent? So I've got a large problem. What's the scale at which it makes sense to use shared memory versus not using shared memory? How big does it have to be before I'm going to start to see advantages? When do I worry about it? When don't I worry about it? Oh, that's interesting. So yes and no. You're saying, okay, I'm doing tangents and logs and all sorts of crazy things. Right. You're bad. Yeah, you're, you're making the decision about whether I'm compute or memory bandwidth limited. Okay, good question. So along those lines, how do I figure that out? Um, to put it in perspective, to do one operation takes a clock cycle. I mean a basic operation of like an addition or something like that. Your tangents and your signs are going to take tens or twenties of, of cycles depending. You can look it up in the programmer's guide. It tells you what, what all those are. To get one value from global memory, it takes 800 clock cycles. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so between 400 to 800. So I, I picked the most pessimistic one to try to make a point. But um, between 400 to 800. So yes, your calculation may be complex, but I'll still say your memory bandwidth limited probably. I'm still just gonna throw that out there. It, it, I'd have to obviously look at the code. You might not be. You really might not be. I don't know. Um, so there's, there's definite pieces uh, to think about there. As for using shared memory itself, the question though is, can you share the results between multiple threads? And I mean, if the answer is no, shared memory isn't useful to you anyway, probably, right? You really need to share. That's why it's called shared memory. If you're just, if you're naively or embarrassingly parallel work on data, shared memory isn't part of in really any interest. It, it's only if you can reuse the data across multiple threads. You're welcome.